Hey buddy, you okay? You've been vomiting all day. You filter your water? You didn't filter your water. Okay, where are your meds at? You don't have any meds. All right, man. Look at them out of my pack. We're gonna get you taken care of. So the question is, what is my experience with urban survival? Well, I served a long time as a survival, evasion, resistance, and escape instructor in the United States military. I got to teach it, and unfortunately, got to experience it in multiple ways, both in exercises throughout the United States, both civilian and military, as well as in real life, when I watched the country fall into madness post a natural disaster. And you have to understand how quick that spiral is and you have to it's just not what you think it is if you think you're going to be going door to door kicking in that door and raiding bottle caps and trading it for right away you're going to kick in a door and die for my guys out there my GWAT veterans who have kicked in doors for a living you know that if you're spending all day kicking in doors with little support probably not going to live very long probably not a good idea to do it for very long for my guys who don't know we're here to educate you a little bit because in this series, which is a direct spin-off of our Becoming Deadly in the Mountain series, you have to understand how complex and how large of a subject urban survival is. It's gonna be really hard for me to explain everything to you in 10 videos. So there's no way I can do it in one video, but we are gonna give you a really good intro to it. And the thing I have to explain to you guys really well is just how brutal it is. In today's video, when we're talking about urban survival, we're talking about a complete breakdown of a government, whether it be United States or wherever country you live in. We're talking about a superior force has taken over this country and you're trying to win it back. And when you're fighting a superior force, the thing you have to understand is no one gives a fuck if you're not ready. No one fucking cares. Nothing about life, about urban survival, about any of this stuff is fair. Just look at what's happening all over the world right now. You might think it's crazy to train or be ready for something like this, but the fact of the matter is, your preparedness to be at the level of a professional soldier could be the difference between a life of slavery or being able to defend your country, defend your family, your religious beliefs, your beliefs. This is serious stuff, guys. So I hope that you guys will join us as we talk today about urban survival. Now, before we get into it, we have to thank the biggest sponsor of this channel, the Sonoran Desert Institute. A big thank you to them. If you're looking to get your start in gunsmithing, they are the way to go. Go and check them out. Big thank you to them. Of course, we have the sponsors for this particular video. We have Zydex Computers, who makes our gaming PCs, and of course, Arms List. A big thank you to them, and don't forget the Patreon. Micah, Patreon. It's uh, Boston. It's, bo it's Boston. Boston. It's everything I don't want you guys to see posted by my camera guy. Questions are answered by me, and absolutely what rocks. You'll get um, first dibs on new hats and slings and gear and all that stuff we're coming out with. So it should be pretty, freaking cool. Ladies, gentlemen, my often forgotten, most certainly not by me, Guerrilla Warfare, welcome to the channel. So glad you can join us today as we talk about urban survival. So the first thing that we need to talk about is we mentioned we're fighting a superior force. The reason for this is we're coming down from the mountains. The mountains are a great place to disappear. However, if you want to retake a country, you're going to need to go into the city centers. When we're talking at this point, we're talking about a very destroyed environment. So you have to understand that there are going to be different considerations and different setups depending on what kind of phase of warfare you're in. At the phase we're at, we're talking straight up open warfare. We're talking destroyed buildings, destroyed cities. And if you've ever seen footage, if you've seen videos, simply look to Europe. There are tons of examples of it right now. So one of the first things that I see brought up when we talk about this type of setup is camouflage. Camouflage is very effective. If you've looked at a destroyed city, a destroyed building, camouflage is going to work. There's no doubt about it. Whether it be multicam, whether it be ATAX, whether it be muted greens, these are excellent camouflages to have. Now, what's going to be difficult is what is your adversary wearing? Are they wearing a digital green? Are they wearing a multicam? Are they wearing a ranger green? Whatever it is, it might not always be in your best interest to be dressed like them. So consider your camouflage, but understand that it is incredibly effective. And a lot of people say they should dress like a gray man. Well, the fact of the matter is we can't underestimate our enemies. At the very least, 
they're going to get your biometrics. So if you're caught in the vicinity of where you were just doing a raid, where you were just getting into a gunfight, where you were trying to retake a city, being a silly little goose, and you get found, even if you drop your gear and you're looking like a normal civilian, they're going to look at the patterns of the veins in your eyes and they're gonna get that biometric data. They're going to look at your fingerprints. They're gonna have that data. They're going to, of course, swab you for explosives, for gunpowder residue, for anything. You have a cut on your cheek. There's gonna be a lot of questions and at minimum, they're gonna know who you are. They're probably gonna detain you. That's only if they follow the rules of war. If they don't, probably it's gonna tell you to dig a hole and they're gonna shoot you and throw you in there. So understand that the level of warfare that we're talking about it doesn't really matter as far as blending into the population that this is always going to depend on the situations, but we're talking all out warfare right here. Now, going from that, we're going to be talking about general principles of urban survival, and we're going to be talking about pack setup because they're pretty much related. Now, when it comes to a pack, I don't want you guys to simply copy what I'm doing. That's what you do every time. Please don't do that. There are many packs that are going to work well. In this case, we have a Mystery Ranch tricep, but the whole point of a pack when we're talking about an urban situation is going to be staying light on your feet and being able to move, to maneuver with it, to be able to fight with it on, to be able to have it to sustain ourselves. For my GWAT guys out there, this is in many ways going to be really familiar, except with a little bit less sustainment of the giant United States government. For my mountaineers, for my people who live in West Virginia, you're going to understand this, these setups pretty well because you guys are used to hardship. But in general, here are the things that I'm looking for. I want a pack that is not going to be wider than my body and my kit. I want that because if I can fit my body and kit through, I want my pack to be able to fit through with me. In addition to that, I don't want the top of my pack to be going over the bottom of my neck right here. And the reason for that is if I go prone, I want to be able to look up. Because <laughs> if you've ever tried to go prone and look up with one of those high frame packs, it's, it's pretty hard, you have to go into a modified position for an assault pack, we just wanna be able to do that. This is going to be geared towards about four to five days of sustainment. And again, a lot of that is going to be travel to the cities and then fading back out of the cities because if you're living in the cities, you're probably having a lot of hardships going on there. But in any case, before we do, the thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is the most important things that you guys can have on your kit and that is going to be your situational awareness. This is something that I cannot teach because it's something that you have to begin to practice. Get your faces out of your phones. Probably a lot of you guys have your faces in your phones right now. That's okay for right now. But I want you to start practicing actually paying attention to what is going on around you. This is something that is imperative that you get good at. And when it comes to that, we have a very simple acronym that we use in our recce video that we'll talk about here, and that is SILS. Stop, look, listen, smell. So when you're getting into an urban area, when you're going with your boys, because you should not be going alone, you should have a team with you. If you're alone, very high probability of death. Make sure that you have a team with you, whether that team be people that you've linked up with after, whether it be neighbors that you're training with right now, you should be getting out there because there's a lot of people out there who would tell you that practicing in your military kit, if you haven't served is LARPing. Well, tell that to the civilians in multiple areas throughout multiple times in history who have had to take up arms to defend their freedom. Wear your kit. As somebody who's served in the military for a long time, I give you permission. Who gives a fuck what people think about what you're doing? Because it could mean the difference between life and death later on should anything ever happen. So talking to SILs, the first thing we wanna do when we're on patrol is stop. The reason we wanna stop is we wanna be able to get a better picture of what is going on. Typically when I have my squad halt or when I've halted with the squad, we wait till all noise dies down. Now in a city that might not always happen, and that's what brings us to our next point. Look, what you want to do is you want to look around. What is occurring around you? What do you see on the ground? Simple things like you see fire on the ground. Somebody was just cooking. You see footprints. There was a recent rainstorm. You can see the wet prints from their boots. What type of footwear do they have on? Is it footwear common to that military? Is it footwear common to their special operations forces? Or is it simply civilians scavenging for food? Look around, what's around you? You should be looking for bullet casings for everything. Do you see helicopters flying? Those are things that you should start to note because you should always have some type of pad on you to begin to get these things down so that you don't forget them. So again, you wanna look. Next thing you wanna do is listen. So again, as that sound dies out from your squad, you wanna look around and listen. 
what are you hearing? Are you hearing the distant crackle of fire? Do you hear gunfire? Do you hear explosions? Do you hear helicopters, jets? Is it signs of your forces? Is it signs of enemy forces? Because if there's one thing that you can tell really well, it's a helicopter. Different helicopters have very distinct noises, and these are things you should become very familiar with. Again, so listen. Finally, smell. What are we smelling for? Well, if you've been living in the woods for a long time, you're gonna have a different scent. That's probably one of the most interesting things about being out in the woods for a long time is seeing how your scent changes or simply going to another country or a different area, you will notice that your scent is going to be different. That's due to hygiene, that's due to what you eat and what you drink. So what you have to understand is these enemy forces are probably gonna smell a little bit different from you. Can you smell them? Do they use detergents to clean themselves? Soap, uh, that's gonna have a certain smell to it. You need to be able to pay attention to this. You smell gasoline. If you're with a force that doesn't have any type of gas powered vehicles because they've been long destroyed and you smell gasoline, that could be a good sign of an enemy force. When I used to teach evasion back in the day, when we'd have a vehicle approaching, we didn't have vehicles, so it's like that, that oh shit factor, right? Everyone would prone out, be completely still, and you just listen to that engine coming closer and closer and closer, and hopefully it kept going, you could hear it fade away. Or if it stopped, it's like that pucker factor went up, your heart rate started increasing. You have to understand like how kind of amped you might be, and you have to learn to keep yourself calm. That's why we have to continue to train with this type of stuff. So with those things out of the way, understand our most important tools aren't so much what we carry on us, but rather your mind. Now, you do need some stuff to survive. So we're gonna be talking about several different topics when it comes to what we have in our packs. We're gonna be talking about sustainment, both water and food. We're gonna be talking about mission essential gear. We'll be talking about entry and exit tools. And finally, we'll be talking about miscellaneous things that you should keep on you. But to start off, we're gonna talk about the most important thing, hydration. Three days. That's about the amount of time you can go without water in a military type operation before you're dead. I will tell you from personal experience and going through multiple dehydration exercises that after about day one, you begin to cramp up to the point where you can't even open your fingers or you have to use the ground to pry them open. By the end of day two, you are awaiting death. So yes, you can go three days in a military operation before you die. However, after about day one, you're gonna find yourself pretty mission ineffective. It's incredibly important that we have water. Now, the thing that you have to understand about the city is how dirty the water is. In um, scenarios that I've done throughout the United States, even in a city that is working, that is functioning, where water purification is happening and there is no bombs being dropped, the water in a lot of cases is not drinkable. So in a lot of cases, we would gather the water prior to going into the city and have that water on us. And that's a general principle I go with. Now, let me explain that a little bit further for one moment. In a jungle type environment, you never, almost never drink water that's falling through the canopy. And the reason for that is animals shit on that canopy. And then the water hits it, it will liquefy that, it will drip down and you think fresh rainwater. But in reality, it's dripping through those feces. Same thing with the city. Birds, rats, whatever are gonna crap on the rooftop. That water's gonna hit, it's gonna drip off that rooftop. Meanwhile, you're sitting there with your bag, just gathering all that water coming off the roof, being like, ah, sweet nectar of the gods. In reality, you might die. With filtering, it's gonna be better, but just understand how dirty water can become. And especially when it comes to groundwater, it's gonna be contaminated with um, gasoline. If there's explosives, uh, any of that residue is gonna be really bad for you. You wanna to try to keep yourself in fit, fighting shape. So here's how I typically handle my urban water situations. It's fairly basic, guys. I have multiple bags of water that I can plus up water as necessary. And what's so great about these modern water containers is they can easily scrunch up when they're not being used and take up virtually no space. So I can easily plus up to nearly 20 liters, which is a ton of water. But there might be times when it's gonna be necessary to hold that much. Now, 20 liters is of course very excessive, but you never know when you're gonna need that much. In any case, I typically use a Sawyer filter when I'm doing any of my water purification. The reason for that, it is simple. It can last 100,000 gallons. It is just what I go for. And in the case of this MSR bag right here, I can simply plug it in, use gravity, and I could purify my water on the go. What's also really nice is that at any water source, whether that be in a city, whether that be outside a city, if it's good water, there's probably gonna be people there. And if there's people there, there's a possibility of getting spotted by somebody you don't want to get spotted by. Try to minimize the amount of time that you spend at a good water source. 
So what's nice about these bags is, of course, I can simply run over, I can dip this in, fill this up to 10 liters, I can scrunch it down, I can go ahead and shut it, and I can take that with me to wherever I need to go, and I don't have to purify at the source. So yes, a lot of those filters that you pump right there in the water are really great. Just understand that that time spent at that water source could ultimately lead to your death. So I definitely recommend something that you can dip and go. One last thing to consider too, is I have dirty and clean bags. You can see right here, the thing that says dirty on it. And what I'm going to do is filter that unfiltered water out into a clean container, such as this hydro flask right here. And this thing is awesome. Therefore you have your clean water bags, which you have clearly marked and you have your dirty bags and you never mix them because you don't want to make that mistake and die of dysentery. One last note is that I typically carry an extra filter on me. They're so small and so lightweight that I think it makes perfect sense to have more than one. So that is what how I pack for water. We learned that from spending a lot of time on the Pacific Crest Trail and watching how those hikers um, did their water long term. And this is a very simple solution that they came up with. Mission essential gear, they can cover a whole lot of things. So we're gonna to try to keep it as concise as we can, but it really depends on what you're trying to do and how much of a silly goose you're trying to be when you get into the city. First thing, you should always have ammunition on you. I typically keep mine in stripper clips with a couple extra magazines. I keep this towards the very top of my pack or in the very top flap, which is the Claymore pouch right there. That works really well. Make sure you have a quick way of getting that ammunition off the stripper clips into your magazines. Ammunition, batteries, whether it be for your radio systems, whether it be for your observation device, devices, make sure that you have enough batteries to sustain you for the duration of whatever you're going to be doing. On the side of the pack right here in our little Spiritus pouch, we have this thermal device right here. Whether this be used for observation, whether you're doing some type of recon assault, whether you're just fighting, you should have some type of thermal observation device. Again, I know this seems unfair because these are so expensive, but if you look at any of the conflicts going on right now, everybody's using thermal. Uh, if you don't have thermal, you're, you're gonna die to somebody who does use thermal. Please have it on you. Other mission essential items that we have is a padding for the um, thermal, also padding for my night vision if I'm switching it off of my helmet. We have our weapon cleaning kit, and then of course, I probably think one of the most overlooked items is some type of small bag. So I have a simple laundry bag right here. This can be used to st store whatever, whether it be my buddy's gear because he got shot. I can add to the amount of, that I have on. Some guys keep a backpack in there. Have some type of extra bag that you can carry your buddy's gear if he goes down. The point of the matter is, is I'm not going to be, be able to explain to you everything that you should carry according to your mission because I don't know what your mission is going to be. Just understand that that Stuff should be easily accessible and should probably include ammunition and batteries to sustain you throughout the duration of that operation. Next up and way lower on the list is going to be food. So a lot of people put a really hard emphasis on food, but you really don't need a whole lot of food. You need a pick me up, you need enough to sustain you, but you don't need a three course meal. The biggest thing here is going to be stuff that you can eat cold and stuff that is very calorically dense. A little bit of variety is gonna help you out a lot but you can really make do with not a lot. Typically what I do is I'll carry a bunch of gummy bears, a bunch of Sour Patch Kids in my cargo pocket. I'll have a little bit more in my pack. In addition, I will have tortillas, peanut butter with some green powder mixed in. That's like a vegetable powder, as well as a little bit of MRE stuff with me to ensure that I have a little bit of variety, but you don't need a whole lot. And again, for, the, for those of you who've been operating perpetually in your basement for the last couple of years, you probably have a little bit of, um, extra survival weight on you anyhow, so you're gonna be fine. Next up is going to be entry and exit tools. And I think this is one of the most interesting parts of the urban environment, is that it's fairly easy to get bottlenecked in a lot of locations. So due to the vertical nature and the fact that everything's man-made, there's gonna be doors, there's gonna be windows, and you're gonna need tools to get through them. Entry and exit tools. A lot of people think of this as a breaching charge, you blow a door, you go in, you kill, it's awesome and you're just hero of the day. But there's a lot more to it because in a urban situation, there's a lot of man-made obstacles that you're gonna to need to get through. And this might not always be just to get into somewhere. This might also be to get out of somewhere. Having multiple exit avenues is going to be extremely important in an urban situation. So having these tools 
could literally mean the difference between getting away or getting captured or killed in many situations. Now, there's a lot of different tools out there. At minimum, you should have a lockpicking kit. There's a lot to say about this. I want to talk about this for literally an hour. Go on YouTube, research it, practice it. You should have this in the bag before anything ever pops off. Just practice it. Now, lockpicking takes some time. It is also very quiet. Now, there are louder methods that are a little bit more expedient. Things like a sledgehammer, those work very well. Things like a bolt cutter, those are absolutely essential. And somebody on your team should have a bolt cutter. Um, we have an axe, for example, if you wanna go full fireman on this. There, it's going to depend on your environment and the types of obstacles you think you're gonna run into, but at minimum, bolt cutters. Now, past there, if you really want to have the key to the city, we of course have a breaching shotgun. So when it comes to a breaching shotgun, there are a couple considerations to think about. This is an 870 MCS. Um, I would generally recommend for most people to have some type of standoff device right here because it can get a little bit dicey if you don't have it. But even if not, what you should realize is that a lot of different rounds will work when it comes to breaching a door. Buckshot and slugs can work. However, there's a pretty high chance of a ricochet. You should have some type of breaching round. Uh, we're lucky that we can get them from great companies like Royal Arms. Um, you can get them from Federal. Uh, the SMBs I don't have as much experience with, but you have to understand that right now you can buy breaching rounds and they work extremely well. Practice with them, understand the techniques. We will have a video eventually about breaching doors and how to do it and the angles that you should be using. But for now, it just stands to say that you should have one of these on you. If you notice, I also have a lanyard on it. This is to attach it to my plate carrier when I need it, along with a magnet to keep it out of the way. So the pack is simply for traveling with it, but it can get right onto my kit. And if you're super spicy and you get your hands on breaching charges at some point in the future, awesome. Understand that. Can't talk about it too much, but learn it. Moving on from there, shelters. There's a lot to be said for shelters. Generally, we're not going to talk too much about shelters in an urban environment. If you're gonna be sleeping, kind of sleep wherever you're observing, getting ready for an ambush or raid, whatever have you. But if you need to hole up somewhere, here's a good acronym for you, BLISS. Blend, make sure that you blend into the environment. Make sure that you are low, that you're below the level of the eye. Also another thing to think about is don't get too high or get too low to where you have no avenues of escape. Make sure that wherever you are, that you have multiple avenues of escape. Make sure that it looks irregular, it doesn't look like a shelter. Make sure that it's secluded. Make sure that you make little sound. And what I mean by that is beyond just talking. Think about the way you sleep. Are you the type of sleeper where you toss and turn? Add cement, add gravel on top of that cement and think about the amount of noise that you'll make. These are all things to consider when you're coming up with your shelter. Now, beyond that, we talked about thermal. You don't want to die from thermal, so an extra little layer of protection can be this guy right here. This is a thermal poncho. This is from Relv Camo. It is two-sided, and it is just that little bit of extra in case you're ever in a situation where you need to not get detected by thermal. Again, the thing about thermal is it has to see you. So this is kind of the last resort. Don't let this touch you because it's still gonna heat up. This is the way it goes. So you want it to be off your body. That is why I have the lines on it so I can tie it up as necessary. Layers, you don't wanna just have one super hot jacket that you put on. What you wanna have is multiple layers. So we have both a thermal top, a thermal bottoms, as well as some type of rain protection because where we are, it rains a ton. In addition to that, I also keep some type of rain cover with me. This can both add camouflage to your pack as well as keep the water from getting in and making everything super wet. Don't forget socks. Always have extra socks. I typically will carry at least two pairs with me. The socks that are dirty or wet, put them right here on your pants, let them dry out as you walk. That way you take care of your feet. Because again, if you don't take care of your feet, uh, you will die, whether that be from trench foot or whether that be because you can't run as fast because your feet are so messed up. It really doesn't take that long for your feet to get in very bad condition. I've seen as few as four days before somebody's feet were just completely donezo. Emergency blanket. If things are really, really bad, this will keep you alive, will reflect your heat back towards you. I keep this just in case. Have one. It takes up little to no space. 
On the side of the pack right here, I've got tubular only nylon. I also keep this on my plate carrier. Uh, if you don't know what this is for, go to Spirit of S Systems. They have a great video on the many uses of this. Have it on you, have a lot, have everybody on your team have it. It is an incredibly useful thing, but if you don't train with it, it doesn't matter. All right, a couple miscellaneous items to talk about. First off, right in the rain. If you don't have a right in the rain, fuck you. One thing that people always forget about is everybody has a trauma kit on their plate carrier, on their you know weapon belt, but not a whole lot of people have a boo-boo kit. So like, I can't tell you how many times I've gone out with military guys on an exercise or whatever, and somebody cuts their finger and they're like, ah, I cut my finger. Does anybody have a Band-Aid? Literally no one. So carry some type of boo-boo kit on you. Um, it's going to be incredibly important. Um, with your boo-boo kit, what I recommend is going into a doctor, tell them you're gonna travel to Nepal, or you're gonna go on some type of long backpacking trip, and ask them if you can get antibiotics, antidiarrheals, antiemetics. These medicines are gonna be worth their weight in gold in a situation where you're not able to get medicine. Have them on hand beforehand. Besides medicines, you should also have simple things like triple antibiotic ointment, band-aids, butterfly band-aids, those simple things that you take for granted until you absolutely need them because a small cut can easily become an infection that can kill you. So have a Band-Aid. Important things like foot powder, like a toothbrush just to brush your teeth a little bit, keep that, those gums healthy. I know it sounds crazy, but if you're doing back-to-back -back operations just out there every single day, coming back, refitting, going back out, you still have to take care of your gums. You still have to take care of your feet. Make sure you have that stuff with you. Make sure that with your foot powder, you have stuff that is unscented. You don't wanna give yourself away. At the very top of my pack, I always carry little sugary things as well as liquid IVs. These are absolutely necessary. Make sure that you have liquid IVs. You will need them. They can be the difference between life and death. Have a can opener, have a spoon, always have an extra spoon with you. Simple items right there. Wet wipes. Don't let yourself get swamp ass and uh, get infected down there. It's a bad way to go. If you are running ATAC or some type of electronic device that needs power, we do have some type of charger. You can charge these back at your base with solar chargers. Have some type of battery pack. For really bad situations where you need to signal friendlies or something along those lines, I do have some uh, VS-17 panel. I recommend having it. They pack down to nothing. and You never know when you're gonna need it for friendly force identification. More spoons, just really sucks to not have a spoon. Mike, you ever lost a spoon when you're backpacking? I've also just forgotten a spoon. Yeah, it sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. You're like digging into food with like your hands. I literally drink, like pour the mountain house into my mouth. It's disgusting. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to do that. Have a spoon, be civilized if you can. Why survive when you can thrive? So that brings us to the end of our talk about basics of urban survival and your salt pack. You don't need to copy what I'm doing. There are a million different ways to do this. What I do ask you to do is have good discussions in the comments and let this be a jumping board for you to set up your own pack, to figure out ways that are gonna work for you. And again, the biggest thing, thing about this is actually do it. Actually pack your pack, move with all their gear on. How does it work for you? These are things I can't tell you. These are things that are gonna be specific to you. Get out there, do it. Now, there are lots of great places to get training when it comes to this. Um, Bear Solutions actually has a Bear Survival. It's actually a guy that I know very well who teaches a lot of this stuff. Get out there, train to it, be better, make yourself the weapon. All this stuff is really cool, but the fact of the matter is that if you don't have any knowledge, you're just gonna be expensive loot drop for someone. Final thing for you guys, I'm gonna say it again. If you're not fit, you're gonna die. I'm gonna keep harping on it, be fit.